day my mother found out she was dying, she sent me out to buy these clear glass marbles. Dad and I hadn't even known she was ill, which was really nothing unusual. Whenever you asked my mother if she was ill, she would throw things at you. Sesame buns, the editorial page, a handful of hair ribbons. Do not, she would say, suggest things to suggestible people. So I brought her the marbles, and she counted out 90 of them and put them in this old cut glass bowl. Apparently, the doctors had given her three months, and she set great store by doctors because she said they were the closest thing to the Old Testament we had. I wouldn't give you two bits for these young smiley guys, she would say. I go for a good stern for a physician. She would even have her teeth cleaned by a dentist under 50. So I brought her the marbles, and she set them in this old bowl on her bedside table. Then she went out and spent $1,200 on nightgowns. She told us, in my family, you are only dying when you take to your beds. And that, my darlings, is where I am going. And she did. Oh, we hashed it around. Dad said she couldn't possibly be dying. But the doctors convinced him. I told her it seemed a little bit evil to lie and stay up here. But she said she didn't want to be distracted from what she loved, us, and that there was nothing outside except drugstores and supermarkets and dry cleaners, and that given her situation, they were beneath her dignity. I asked her what she intended to do up here, and she said study French, visit with us, and maybe call a few pals. Study French? She said she'd made a pledge to herself years ago to die bilingual. Dad and I cried a lot, but she didn't. From then on, the doctors had to come see her, because as she put it, she came in with the house call, and she was going out with the house call. And all day, every day, she would hold one of these marbles in her hand. Why? She said it made the day longer. Mother had her own bedroom. That's the way it had been for as long as I can remember. She called my father the thrasher. Dad could really get into a nightmare. Apparently, early on in the marriage, he had flipped over and broken her nose. And that was it. Separate beds. Mother's room was very spare, really. Wooden floors. An old steel and brass bed. Oak dresser. Bedside table. And don't ask me why. A hat rack. No pictures on the walls. Mother could never understand how people could stand to look at the same darn thing day after day. She said it was bound to deflate the imagination. And after dinner, we would sit with my mother and talk about issues. She said she was too far gone for gossip or what we'd eaten for lunch. And then we would all turn in. And in a little while, just before I would drift off, I would hear a marble rolling across your floor. I'd hear this every night. After the third or fourth day, I saw one on the floor and bent to pick it up. But she said, leave it, very sharply. How come? She said she was learning to let go of them. Oh, she passed the time. There were things she wanted. She made a list of children's books from her own childhood, and we got as many of them as we possibly could find from the local library. She wrote notes to, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 people. They told us they were sort of formal little goodbyes, each of them recalling some incident or shared something. Not very significant. But the odd thing was that in each and every one of them, she included a recipe. A recipe in every one of them. We got 
out the old cookie tin full of snapshots that somehow never became a scrapbook. She liked that. And she showed my father how she handled the accounts and how she did the medical insurance. We went through her jewelry and she made a list of the roofers, the plumbers, and the air conditioning people. She called it wrapping it up. Well, this is good, she would say. I'm wrapping it up. Then she had the TV moved to her room and she called me aside one day to say that it was entirely possible that she may reach a stage where she would not know what she was watching, but that I must promise to keep it on PBS. Later on, when it started getting hard, she told my father and I that she would like to spend more time alone. She said that she was glad and that she hoped that we would be, because it got less, it, it was arranged so that you got less attached to the ones you loved. The end. The next period isn't worth going into. It was just hard. Do you know that from the very beginning down to the very last, she never admitted to any pain? Never. She just called it the chills. And the last thing she asked for was a picture of a Labrador Retriever her and my father had owned when they were first married. He was, she said, a perfectly dreadful dog. When you were young, she said, you believe in the perfectibility of dogs. I was in bed two weeks ago, Wednesday towards dawn, when I heard a loud crash and marbles rolling across her floor. Dad and I ran in here, and she was gone. Dead. When the emergency medical people got here, they found this. The rest had spilled when the table fell, but this, this was still in her hand. I keep it. Keep it close to me all day. It makes the day longer. There is a story that Abraham Lincoln had a dream, warning him that it was dangerous to go to Ford's Theater, where he was later assassinated. The concept that dreams are symbolic or represent hidden mm -hmm. impulses, needs, and desires has been around forever. As long as this concept has been tossed about, so of ideas about how we dream and why we dream. Today, however, researchers have made great discoveries in the areas of dreams. I would like to tell you about some of these discoveries. I will specifically cover dream occurrence, dream content, and dream necessity. Before a dream can occur, you, as a sleeper, must go through a certain cycle of four stages of sleep. As you begin to fall asleep, your body temperature and pulse rate drop and your breathing becomes slow and even, thus starting the first of four stages of sleep. In stage one, the brain gives off irregular waves, and your breathing becomes slow and uneven. The body may twitch and the eyes may roll, causing brief visual images to flash across your mind. This stage usually lasts for about five to ten minutes. In stage two, the brain exhibits bursts of activity, the eyes, however, usually remain still. In stage three, you move on into a deeper sleep. The brain waves become slow and regular, and your breathing becomes slow and even. At this point, it is difficult to awaken anyone. Stage four is a deep sleep. If you're awakened by a loud noise during this stage, you will not remember it. Sleepwalking and bedwetting generally occur during this stage leaving no trace of memory. Most authorities agree that on the average night, stage four sleep lasts for about 90 minutes. After finishing stage four, you climb through stages three, two, and one. Upon returning to stage one, something curious happens. Although your muscles are more relaxed than before, your eyes begin to dart rapidly back and forth behind closed-up lids. 
You have now entered REM sleep. REM is an acronym for rapid eye movement. During REM, the levels of sexual and adrenaline hormones rise in the blood, as if you're doing a physically demanding activity. The brain waves resemble those of a fully awake person. It is during this stage that almost all dreaming takes place. During REM, your motor senses are inhibited. This is why during a dream, when you feel you cannot move, you actually cannot. REM usually lasts for about 10 minutes. Then you go back through the stages down to stage 4. Most people go through the cycle about every 90 minutes. Each time, the length of stage 4 decreases while REM increases. Therefore, dreams are more common in the latter part of sleep. Although most people are unaware of how and why they dream, they are aware of the content of their dreams. Most dreams are about ordinary events or normal things that the person does during the day. Dreams may contain materials about fears, worries, or feeling inferior, because these are, these are the concerns that the person has during the day. Arguments are also common in dreams. Usually the person dreaming turns out to be right in his own dream. According to an Evans and Evans report, in 1983, 70% of our dreams are about people we know. There are, however, unexpected common images in our dreams. For example, 40% of women dream about the sea or bodies of water, while only 29% of males do. Falling or being chased is a very common dream to both sexes. Another common dream is being caught naked in public. Bizarre dreams may also occur. Usually, the main part of the dream is reasonable, but the story winds up in a strange place, or with people you don't expect. About 50% of our dreams are in color, and the other 50% are in black and white. Despite numerous experiments, researchers have not figured out why this is so. Many people believe that our dreams may be significant. Dream interpretations can be traced back to 5,000 years before Christ. Sigmund Freud, however, was the first modern era psychologist to argue that dreams do play an important part in our emotional life. According to Freud, no matter how simple, dreams may contain clues about the thoughts or desires that we're afraid to express during our waking hour. Some social scientists, however, are skeptical of dream interpretations. Nathaniel Kleitman, one of the founders of REM sleep, wrote in 1960. Dreams may serve no purpose whatsoever. According to Kleitman, dreams are simply an unimportant byproduct of brain cells during sleep. No matter how silly or unimportant dreams may seem, they are necessary for sleep. In one experiment, people were prevented from dreaming. They were awakened during REM. When they were finally allowed to sleep undisturbedly, they dreamed almost twice as long as if to catch up on the dream they had missed. In addition, they experienced behavioral changes. They became irritable, had trouble concentrating, and experienced memory lapses. When they were awakened during other stages of sleep, their behavior remained normal, and their dreaming did not increase. This evidence supports the idea that dreams are necessary for sleep. Knowing about dream occurrence, dream content, and dream necessity, will not give us control over our dreams. It will, however, make us more aware of the power and the process of our dreams. Perhaps Lincoln would have stayed home if he'd known what we know today. Sibling rivalry has always been around. To parents, the reasons behind the arguments may sometimes seem petty, but to a child, they are very important. The Pain and the Great One by Judy Bloom. My brother's a pain. He won't get out of bed in the morning. My mother has to carry him into the kitchen. He should get dressed himself. He's six. He's in the first grade. But he's so pokey, Daddy has to help him or he'd never be ready in time and he'd miss the bus. He cries if I leave without him. Then Mom gets mad and yells at me, which is another, which is another reason why my brother's a pain. He's got to be first to show Mom his schoolwork. 
She says ew and ah over all his pictures, which aren't really great at all. Just ordinary first grade stuff. At dinner he picks at his food, 